Are you facing any troubles these days? I believe all of us are probably facing some troubles of some sort. Tonight, we welcome you until that day, New Rocky Creek, our study, The Time of Jacob's Trouble. Do you know what this means? Have you ever studied this? Do you know the time frame this would include? What, in, when, and how, and who was Jacob? So, we're studying it. Welcome, and I want you to interact with me as we study this together. I appreciate you. Love you in the Lord. Pray for you as we trust you'll pray for us. So let's get right in our study. There'll be four probing questions in regards to the time of Jacob's trouble. And we'll uh, address this after we read the text. And we'll address the questions. Who was Jacob? And when does this time of Jacob's trouble? And why does this time of Jacob's trouble happen? And how will all of this affect Bible prophecy? Notice the text, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Before I read that, I want you to grab your Bibles and a pen and a piece of paper and write some comments about your interpretation of Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and more specifically about your troubles, how we can pray for you. Look at chapter 30, and verse 7. Well, let me be back up to verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Keep in mind, Jeremiah's calling in chapter 1, and verse 5, the Lord said, I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. That speaks of God's foreknowledge. Aren't you glad that he, he's a God of the past and the future and sees everything in between? The Lord said, I ordained you, Jeremiah, to be a prophet, and I called you. And so his calling, but then his condition was, he was primarily preaching to the southern kingdom of Judah and it was a troubled time, to say the least. It was a hopeless time that turned into hope, as we'll read in this chapter, that the Lord gave promises that the people of God would return to their homeland. Do you ever feel hopeless? It was a, not only the condition of Jeremiah, but the confinement. He was thrown in prison for preaching the word of God, but the commitment he had. And that leads us to chapter 30. Remember chapter 29, those famous words, I know the thoughts I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. You'll seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Remember now, the Lord is speaking to Israel, Judah primarily, in the book of Jeremiah. And so we come to chapter 30, verse uh, 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it. God gave them real estate. This is a partial fulfillment, but also a futuristic fulfillment. The aliyahs, when Israel returns Jews to their homeland. Remember in the days of Jacob, they left Egypt. Well, I say they left Egypt. They were taken into Egypt during Joseph's reign, and they ended up leaving their promised land to go to Egypt. But then the Lord brought them back into the land as with the days of uh, Joshua and the people of God. Now, keep reading because he says in verse 7, Alas, for that day is great. What day? The day of Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. So that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. The word trouble there means distress. It means uh, straits. You ever feel distress? You ever feel straits? Paul said we're troubled on every side, yet not in distress. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Tribulation worketh patience, says Paul in Romans chapter 5. And patience, experience, experience, hope. So troubles. But wait a minute, does that what this mean about Jacob's trouble? Who does that mean? What's it talking about? He shall be saved, but he'll be saved out of it. That's a great promise from the Lord. Let's get in our study. Here's the probing question. Number one, who is Jacob? Number two, what is meant by this time of Jacob's trouble? Number three, uh, when is all of this going to occur? And then finally, number four is how is all this going to turn out? So let's get right in our study. The 12 tribes of Israel or Jacob. Remember now there was bad, bad blood between Jacob and his brother Esau from the time of their birth. Jacob's name means heel catcher or conniving supplanter which uh, Jacob had to learn 
uh, to trust the Lord. And anyway, so Jacob was more of a mama's boy, whereas Esau, a daddy's boy, you might say. But it's interesting to note his parents, Jacob's that is, would be Isaac and Rebekah. And the Lord showed Rebekah that the elder, meaning Esau, would serve the younger Jacob. That was a promise before they were even born. And furthermore, that there would be two nations warring in the womb of Rebekah. To this day, they still war. I believe the Esau, uh, Esau's descendants, Edomites, which relocated, by the way, over to Petra or in Mount Seir, and, which is modern-day Jordan, uh, and later became, I believe, it's a good indication, the Palestinians, they still war against Jacob's descendants, meaning the Israelites. Now, Jacob had 12 children, and here are the 12 sons of Jacob. I won't take time to explain all of that other than saying this, all 12 returned to their homeland under Ezra. There's this teaching about the 10 lost tribes of Israel. I do not read the Bible that way. Instead, I see in the book of Ezra they offered 12 he-goats when they returned to the land, and all the 12 tribes returned with them. That's another message for another time. Who is Jacob? Remember now, Jacob, after stealing both the birthright and the blessing, the birthright from his brother Esau because he, he wanted a mess of pottage, he wanted immediate gratification and satisfaction. Isn't that like uh, our world today? And so Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, who had made a bowl of soup, basically. And then secondly, he stole the birthright from his older brother. The elder would receive the, the blessing. And yet Jacob deceived his aged old dad into thinking that he was Esau instead of Jacob. So meanwhile, uh, Esau is red hot. And so Jacob makes his journey up from Beersheba all the way over to Haran to eventually find his wife, excuse me, wives, plural, which is not necessarily the will of God. It was uh, permitted. It was not really the perfect will of God. Anyway, I'll leave that as it is, uh, other than saying Jacob had the 12 children, 12 sons. So we've described who Jacob is. His name was changed, by the way, from Jacob to Israel as he wrestled with the angel and said, I will not let thee go until they bless me. I love that. I love that. Jacob knew he needed a change. Do you need a change? He was changed from Jacob, the deceiver, to Israel, the prince that prevails with God. You need a change today. The Lord's in the life-changing business. Praise the Lord. So we talked about who. Now let's talk about what? The time of Jacob's trouble. What are we talking about? We're talking about a time frame that Daniel was able to pinpoint and find in a futuristic sense 490 years. Let me carry you back quickly to Daniel 9.24. Daniel 9.24, Daniel's in Babylon, and he's speaking to the Jews, not the church, but Israel. He said, 70 weeks are determined for thy people and thy holy city, thy people being the Jews, thy holy city being Jerusalem. 70 weeks. Now, when you see the word weeks, it's Shabua, and what it means is seven years. I derive that from, you can read in the context of Daniel chapter 9. So, to calculate the number of years that Daniel is looking into the prophetic future, 70 times 7, 490 years. Daniel was able to look in the prophetic future and see that this 490 years would be for Israel, not the church, Israel. Very important. And then he starts the time clock ticking in this uh, 490 years when the Jews returned back to their homeland in 444 B.C. to rebuild the temple. And I derived that particular thought from Daniel 9.25. He said, know this, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem under the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. Remember, seven weeks. Seven, that would be seven times seven, 49 years. Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's Daniel 9, 25. Three score and two weeks would be 434 years. And 434 years plus 49 years from 444 B.C. would be 483 years. 483 years from 490 would leave seven years left. That's the 70th week. All of this would include 69 weeks, 483 years. Here's a chart showing that. That is, you may not be able to see this really well, but anyway, I copied this to help you to see Jeremiah's time frame is in the Babylonian, uh, really preaching to Judah, and the uh, Babylonians invaded in 605 B.C., at, by the way, after the Assyrians had taken the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. Here's a time frame. It helps me tremendously to get some time frames in my mind. 722 B.C., 605 B.C., which was afterwards, 
the Babylonians invaded under Nebuchadnezzar, took captivity. Those Jews, three invasions, really, uh, 599 and 598, 597. Eventually, he burned the city. It was destroyed, and right here is the reference, in the year of 586 uh, B.C. Here it is right here, destruction of the temple. And thus, all the Jews were taken into their homeland. So here's a chart Dr. Randall Price allowed me to use. I'm giving credit. I called him and asked him. You may not be able to see it real good. Basically, it shows the 69 weeks that I just described from the time of Nehemiah and the coming back to rebuilding the walls as described in Daniel 9.25 all the way up to the uh, time of the uh, Messiah being cut off. This is a tremendous messianic uh, prophecy that the Lord fulfilled. And to precisely to the date, uh, 173,880 days. You can check it out. One of our other videos is absolutely incredible, to say the least. But there's further references to the 70th week. Here's 69 weeks right here that's already been fulfilled. But the 70th week is yet to be fulfilled, which would be one week or seven years, where we get our origin of the tribulation. And so as we study this together, let's go a little further. Who is we talking about? The time of Jacob's trouble? What do we mean by this? We just saw that Daniel prophesied it, but when is it going to occur, the time of Jacob's trouble? Is it now? Is it later? Certainly the Jews are in hot water. Even today I read where Netanyahu, the prime minister, took a bold stand and said, no, that there was this movement to try to curtail Christians from witnessing and sharing their faith, evangelism, in Israel, but needless to say, it was denied, and so that is good news, but there's still a uh, very, uh, how can I say it, there's a very uh, troubling situation in Israel right now. We'll see how the Lord's word will be fulfilled. So we're talking about when is all of this going to take place. Notice the tribulation. I just told you Daniel's prophecy, if you skip down to verse number 27 in Daniel 9, you'd find out this. He shall confirm, and he being the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, one week, seven years, in the midst of the week, that is three and a half years or 1260 days, in the midst of the week, he shall cause, he the Antichrist, cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and the overspreading of the abomination, even the consummation. That to be determined and poured out upon the desolate. Remember now, the Antichrist, after the rapture of the church, will move on the scene. Political ruler, economical ruler, military ruler, and according to Revelation 13, he will desire to be worshipped. Revelation 13, 4 says that economical ruler, and as well as a uh, Revelation 13, 16 through 18, and yet there'll be a false pseudo plan put in place with the Jews, and that will be, uh, I believe, in place during Ezekiel 38, 39. Peace and safety. Paul wrote about that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. But the point is, this is the time frame when the day of Jacob's trouble will take place. I'll explain more about that in a minute, but I want to give you a time frame as we look at this chart. And this is right prior to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that Jesus is coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're with him in heaven after the judgment seat and after the marriage of the Lamb, we'll come back with him, but he's coming as the king. Why? Because Matthew's gospel portrays our Lord as the king of the Jews. However, they rejected him as the king of the Jews. Consequently, the kingdom has been postponed until the thousand-year reign. The Lord wanted to bring the kingdom at that time. Preach the kingdom of God is at hand. And therefore, when he comes, they'll look upon him whom they pierced and mourn. That's Zechariah chapter uh, 12 and verse 10. However, there'll be many, many saved. But let me go back to the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is this? We've already talked about Jacob. What, what does this mean? We've talked about Daniel's prophecy. And when will it take place? It looks like it's going to be during the tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble. But now, how is all this going to end up? Here's another chart that in regards to Israel's last seven years. You'll notice here the first three and a half years, peace and safety, even though the seven vials, uh, they'll be begin to be poured out, the wrath of God on planet Earth in the beginning of that, worldwide, the white horse rider, black horse rider, red horse rider, and the pale green horse rider, 
uh, one fourth of the population have died. However, at the midway point, as we just alluded to in Daniel 9 27, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and show himself that he is God. Paul makes reference to that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, and as well as Daniel 9 27. So that is the point when the Antichrist will begin to persecute and martyr, kill, slay many uh, during that tribulation time. And so here is the time of Jacob's trouble. If you read the book of Revelation 12, I'll not take time now, but simply point out the fact that there is a description of this woman and this dragon and this man-child that's to be born. Uh, technically speaking, the correct interpretation would be the dragon is none other than the devil himself. It defines that and describes that if you read continuous into that chapter, chapter 12. However, the woman is defined as you can go back to the book of Genesis chapter 37 to find out, and you can see our video on this chapter, chapter 12 of Revelation, and go in more detail, the woman is none other than Israel. However, this woman is going to have a man-child. Who is the man-child? Jesus Christ. So the dragon is out to devour the man-child. We know from day one. It was the plan from day one that Satan would try to divert the plan of Almighty God to keep the humanity from being forgiven and to, that is, the, uh, Satan, to control the world. He's the prince of the power of the air. There was a certain amount of dominion given to him when man fell in the garden. And therefore, the Lord Jesus will come back and throw him in the lake of fire. So, now, if you read Revelation 12, you'd find out the woman fled into the wilderness. That's Israel. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. And so, as we continue on in this study, I want to define when and what God's going to do in this time of Jacob's trouble. As I said, uh, this text says that uh, he shall save them out of this, but he shall save and be saved. He shall be saved out of it. That is Israel. The day of the Lord is another phrase that I have not gone into, the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, can I quickly wrap up this study in just a few moments? And here it is, that Israel will be the focal point in the tribulation. 144,000 Jews, for example, saved out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the two witnesses will be preaching. And therefore, but unfortunately, uh, two-thirds of the Jews will die during the tribulation time leading up to the second coming of Christ, the battle of Armageddon. We conclude that from the book of Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 8. And not only that, but we also conclude that one-third will be spared during the tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble. And uh, so the Lord's got a plan for Israel. He's got a plan for the church. And so as we prepare to come back with Jesus Christ and then the judgment of the nations will take place when Jesus comes to the earth, no man knows the hour, only the Father in heaven, Matthew 24, 36. And then John reveals that in Revelation chapter 19, that he comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and out of his mouth go a sharp sword. That's the reference to the Armageddon. Zechariah 14, 4 describes him coming. He put his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will cleave in two from the east to the west. All of that is leading up to the entering into this 1,000-year millennial reign. And many Jews are those that were sealed that will go into the millennial reign with a physical body. We'll, however, go in with a glorified body after the rapture of the church. We'll be like Jesus. So this is the message of the day of Jacob's trouble. Remember now, the Lord's got a plan for Israel, and many their eyes will be open. Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, Israel's past, Israel's present, Israel's future. And ultimately, they'll receive the real estate God promised them, as you can see depicted on this chart. God's not finished with his people. I want to ask you this question. Are you trouble? The time of Jacob's trouble we've talked about. But what about the time of your trouble? How can I pray for you? Tribulation worketh patience. Let's pray together. I'm praying the blessings of the Lord that you'll keep trusting him. And as we see the Bible unfolding before our very eyes, God's got a plan for you, even in the times of trouble. Because remember, the Lord's promised to be with us. He's promised for Israel. He's going to honor his unconditional covenants. 
and also for the church. He's coming back, Jesus, the bridegroom for us. So let's join together to pray. Uh, as you experience troubles, that tribulation works patience. Not only that, but troubles can turn into triumphs, as we see for Israel. Father, thank you that in the midst of troubles and trials, you have a plan and a purpose, and you're able to conform us to your image. And Father, thank you for the truth of your word, the promises that you will keep because you're a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah. And you've got a plan for your people as you had a people and a plan and a place, and now it's being unfolded before our very eyes, and ultimately in the future, Father, you will fulfill your word as many will turn to you. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem now because, Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. One day you'll come in glory and power. And thank you, nobody can stop you. But, Father, as the church, and I know many of your people, even Jews, can turn to you now and be saved, but yet those who... Uh, have already passed, and those who will not turn to you, even some during the time of we've been studying Jacob's trouble, you'll fulfill your word. You will save them, Jesus, as they turn and trust you as their Messiah. We pray now for your glory that you would be glorified in this, as many people that are listening that are hurting and trouble and feel hopeless that they would know there's hope in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the lives that will be changed, even this very moment. When all said and done, we'll give you glory because you're worthy of it. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you now again, and God be with you till we meet again.